Hi, I'm Jade. I'm a medical student in Leicester. In this video, you will revise important topics in palliative care using some clinical cases written by Matthew Tucker. We will go through opioid conversions, management of symptoms at the end of life, anticipatory medications, and advanced care planning. Let's begin. What is palliative care? The definition of palliative care from the World Health Organization is as follows. Palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problems associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psychosocial and spiritual. So, the main focus of palliative care is to improve the quality rather than length of life by reducing pain and distressing symptoms. It also integrates psychological and spiritual aspects of patient care to support people to live as actively as possible until their death. Palliative care can be combined with life-prolonging treatments early in the course of diseases. Any patients with advanced, progressive illness can benefit from palliative care, ideally as early as possible after diagnosis. Next, let's discuss managing symptoms at the end of life. At the end of life, some symptoms like constipation, confusion, nausea, secretions, restlessness, breathlessness and pain are common. The aim of palliative care is to reduce these symptoms to keep patients as comfortable as possible. Some medications are prescribed prophylactically to all patients at the end of their life, and these are called anticipatory medications or just-in-case medications. Nausea should be treated according to the underlying cause, for example, intracranial disease, metabolic imbalance, or chemotherapy. PRN antiemetics such as haloperidol or levomepromazine can also be prescribed. Match the following antiemetics to the patients who would get the most benefit from them. Pause the video for more thinking time. Ondansetron, which is a 5-HT3 antagonist, would be ideal for nausea following chemotherapy as it acts centrally in the chemoreceptor trigger zone of the medulla oblongata. Cyclozine, which is an antihistamine, is ideal for the patient with nausea due to brain mets as it acts centrally on the chemoreceptor trigger zone to reduce the vomiting response. Dexamethasone can also be used if the patient has increased intracranial pressure as this would reduce the swelling and has additional antiemetic properties. Haloperidol is the antiemetic of choice when there is a chemical cause of the nausea, such as raised serum calcium levels. Other options include levomepromazine and cyclozine. And lastly, metoclopramide would be the antiemetic of choice when nausea is caused by gastric stasis as it's prokinetic. It's a D2 receptor antagonist and must be avoided in bowel obstruction. Excessive respiratory secretions, although they usually cause no trouble to patients, can be shocking for their family and friends to observe and hear. They can be managed conservatively by preventing fluid overload or medically using hyacin butyl bromide, also known as buscopan, or glycopyronium bromide. Confusion, restlessness and anxiety can be symptoms of a reversible condition or may be natural symptoms of dying. Underlying reversible causes for confusion should be ruled out before treating with haloperidol or levomepromazine. Breathlessness can be treated with midazolam and morphine to suppress the respiratory rate. Pain optimization is essential. Usually patients are offered regular oral modified release morphine with oral immediate release morphine for breakthrough pain. If patients use lots of PRN morphine during the day, then the regular morphine dose may need to be up titrated. This is done by adding up the total morphine daily dose and dividing this value by two to give the new morphine moderate release dose, as moderate release morphine is usually administered twice daily. The total morphine daily dose is then divided by six for the new morphine immediate release breakthrough dose, which can be prescribed PRN. Side effects of opioids include transient nausea, vomiting, and drowsiness, plus constipation. So laxatives like Senna should be co-prescribed for all patients starting opioids. In patients with chronic kidney disease, alfentanil, buprenorphine, and fentanyl are used instead of morphine. 
Patients with metastatic bone pain may find bisphosphonates or radiotherapy particularly helpful as pain relief. Constipation is another common symptom experienced by patients at the end of their lives. Stimulant laxatives like Senna are usually used as they reduce the bowel transit time. Docosate sodium or sodium picosulfate are particularly useful when stools are firm and difficult to pass. Next, let's move on to another clinical case. Pause the video and see if you can work out the answer to the question. So, this patient has been taking 15 milligrams of Oromorph PRN every three hours. 15 milligrams of Oromorph every three hours for two days. That means in one day, he would be taking eight PRN doses of 15 milligrams. That makes a total of 120 milligrams in a day. He's also having 40 milligrams of Zomorph twice daily. The total morphine dose in one day is then 120 plus 40 plus 40, which gives you 200 milligrams. How do we convert oral morphine to subcut morphine? Simply divide the oral dose by two. 200 divided by two gives you 100. Therefore, we can prescribe 100 milligrams of morphine subcut over 24 hours. The adjusted PRN dose for breakthrough pain is one sixth of the total daily morphine dose. 100 divided by six gives you around 15 milligrams. To convert a patient from codeine or tramadol to oral morphine, divide the dose by 10. To convert from oral morphine to subcut morphine, divide the dose by two. If you're converting from oral morphine to oral oxycodone though, divide by 1.5, and from oral morphine to subcut diamorphine, divide by three. Oral oxycodone has fewer side effects than oral morphine, such as sedation, pruritus, and vomiting. Transdermal patches are also used for pain relief. A transdermal fentanyl 12 microgram patch equates to approximately 30 milligrams oral morphine daily, and a transdermal buprenorphine 10 microgram patch to approximately 24 milligrams of oral morphine daily. But if the pain isn't well controlled, it's important to reassess the causes of pain and the treatments previously tried. Treat the cause of the pain if reversible causes are found. In palliative care, alternative methods of pain control are used and have been very beneficial to patients as there are reduced side effects. Part B of the question asked about non-pharmacological methods of pain relief. Some examples of alternative methods of pain control are aromatherapy, massage, reflexology, and creative visualization and relaxation. Pain can feel worse for the patient if they are preoccupied with certain stresses and worries. It's important to have open communication with your patient and support them with their concerns. For instance, if they're worried about finances after they die, then helping them to arrange their wills and meet with attorneys can put their minds at ease and help them to cope better with their pain. Next, we will talk about anticipatory medications. Just-in-case meds or anticipatory meds are given to all patients in the final days of their life to help prevent symptoms that usually occur. Pain relief, for example morphine, diamorphine, oxycodone or alfentanil is given. Midazolam is given to prevent breathlessness and to help relax the patient and prevent anxiety or agitation. Nausea and vomiting are prevented by prescribing cyclozine, metoclopramide, haloperidol or levomepromazine, and finally hyacine hydrobromide or hyacine butylbromide or glycopyronium is usually given to prevent excessive respiratory secretions. Let's review another clinical case. Pause the video now for more thinking time. An antiemetic like levomepromazine or haloperidol would be ideal as they are also anxiolytic. Beware that cyclozine may exacerbate heart failure. Morphine for pain and breathlessness, glycopyronium for secretions, and midazolam for agitation should also be prescribed. Next, we will answer the question, what is an advanced care plan, a respect form, and a DNA CPR? A DNA CPR is not a legally binding document. Ultimately, the decision to resuscitate is the medical team's decision. However, CPR has a low success rate, especially in patients who are already quite unwell, such as those with chronic debilitating diseases. It is also very invasive and traumatic and can restore a patient with a poor quality of life that they may not want. 
Therefore, while the patient has capacity, they may make the decision to refuse CPR at the point where they have a cardiac arrest. This does not mean that treatment and care will stop or change in any way. It is only relevant in the scenario where a patient's heart stops. It's important to make this distinction really clear with the patient. Discussion around DNA CPR forms are best done as part of a wider discussion about advanced care planning overall. Advanced care planning may include choosing whether a patient would want to be cared for at the end of their life, which treatments they may choose to refuse, appointing someone legally to make decisions on their behalf in the event that they lose capacity, and noting their wishes and preferences. The RESPECT form is a type of advanced care plan. RESPECT stands for Recommended Summary Plan for Emergency Care and Treatment. It contains personalised recommendations for a person's clinical care and treatment in a future emergency in which they are unable to make or express choices. The form is filled in based on conversations between the patient, their families and healthcare professionals in which patients' priorities and preferences are taken into account alongside clinical recommendations. The RESPECT form is not legally binding and it can be reviewed and adapted regularly if the patient wishes. The plan should stay with the patient so that it is always available to healthcare professionals faced with making immediate decisions about treatment and management in an emergency in which the person themselves has lost capacity to participate in making those decisions. The last clinical case. Pause the video to come up with a management plan. The fact that this gentleman has a DNA CPR in place is not relevant in this scenario as he does not have a cardiac arrest. However, the respect form is. Although it is not a legally binding document, his wishes should be respected and it's fair to say that there are not many benefits of treating him in hospital. Ideally, he should be managed in the community with regular visits from GPs, the palliative care team and community nurses to ensure he is treated with antibiotics and symptomatic management to prevent him suffering from troublesome symptoms. If it is thought that his condition is swiftly deteriorating and he is showing signs that he is at the end of his life, then anticipatory medications should also be prescribed, as such a deterioration would still not necessitate admission against his documented wishes. Thanks for watching!